very kindly asked me to come and to talk about um, last days of life, um, and in particular about the Namaste Care Programme, which I'm currently involved in a research programme to evaluate. Um, I wasn't sure how much we would have on um, end-of-life care before we got to me, so um, the session really begins with, I, th I think it will be a very quick revision, because collectively through, through the day, um, I think the, that we've really had a background to, to end-of-life care for people with dementia. I'm going to hear the carer's perspective from, from Norma, um, and just briefly consider the challenges for palliative care in delivering end-of-life care to people with dementia. And then to look at the um, end-of-life Namaste care programme for people with dementia. Um, and here's the beginning to the background. But actually, I can't leave you all waiting because I, I hope that at least some of you are as ignorant as I was and, and don't know what, what Namaste means. I, I did know it was a, a greeting from India. Um, and the, the meaning that, that is, is taken in, in, in the care program is that Namaste means to honor the spirit within. And it is both a greeting and a farewell. Um, this is just the, the uh, uh, just a reminder, really, just, just to, to register the, the distance traveled from the early diagnosis that um, Subi Banerjee was talking about earlier on, where we're briefly, p perhaps, um, begin to be personally aware of some functional decline. But it's a very long journey to the final stages of, of the illness, where speech is, is hardly intelligible and, and reduced perhaps to a day a, a, day a, word, a, a, a word a day <laughs> or less, where people can't walk, can't, can't even sit up, and finally that they are unable to smile. It's really significant, I think, that, that the smile, that emotional responsiveness, is really lost to, to submerge. It's a big problem with dementia to, to really realize when end of life does come for people with dementia. It's a very long, a very unpredictable journey. We're, there are a few palliative care professionals and, and, and others here who are probably very familiar with this um, cancer trajectory of the whole lot where function is plotted against time. And, um, and actually, you know, I, I remember people having palliative chemotherapy going into the hospital on the bus. <laughs> with, with cancer, people maintain function really long into the disease, and then there is a sudden decline, and it's fairly predictable. With dementia, it's quite otherwise. Function declines early on, and people go up and down. <laughs> Sorry, I'll keep near to the microphone. People are, 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 Barbara Poynton, the Alzheimer's ambassador, described it as, as bumping along the bottom. And I have to say that as a, as a family carer for someone with dementia, I'm very aware that every time you're going down, you're on the same slope as, as the family of someone with cancer. Um, and it's, it's, it's a, an experience that Norma's going to talk a little about. Hello. I would like to talk to you about Alan, my husband. He had frontotemporal dementia, and he died just over six years ago. He died in a nursing home approximately four months after he had been in hospital, which had not been a good experience. In the nursing home, he was a person again. He wasn't a number in a bed. He was given loving care, and he was respected. Alan, fairly early on in his dementia, had communication difficulties, and he eventually was unable to speak or unable to write. That didn't mean he didn't understand. His frustration was that what was in his head did not come out on the paper, and what was in his head did not come out through his mouth. 
he was shown talking mats. He knocked them out of the way. I tried to teach him Makaton, and he just laughed at me. He worked out for himself. Thumbs up for yes, thumbs down for no, and that was to tell me to leave him. Towards the end of May, Alan developed a chest infection, and he was prescribed liquid antibiotics. On the third day, I came to his room, and I saw Paula, the manager, who was sitting by his bed giving him the antibiotics, and she was talking to him in such a loving way. I was, I was really, really touched. But I could see Alan's eyes were actually quite big, and he looked frightened. And then I saw the liquid was pouring out of his mouth. Paula came over to me, and she explained very quietly that they thought perhaps during the night Alan had had a stroke because he was no longer able to swallow. And I said very quietly, has the time come? And she said, I think so. Not long afterwards, the doctor arrived, and suddenly, there we were, a group of people standing in the corner of the room, whispering. It was awful, awful. And I could see Alan behind us, his eyes getting bigger and bigger. He knew. I managed to get everybody out onto the landing, and we stood there making decisions. Uh, the doctor suggested hospital. Remembering what we'd been through before, I said, well, what quality of life will he have when he comes out? And she said, none. So I said, I really would prefer him to stay where he was loved and cared for. And Paula said she was more than happy to do that. And she said, Norma, remember, after Alan has gone, people will move away. But we are always here for you. And if you don't find us, we will find you. And I'm still involved there. Now, advanced care planning was not there. Not even and end-of-life care planning, well, was never thought of. How much pain and confusion it would have taken away had I not had to make decisions on the spur of the moment when I was in that emotional state. Thank goodness they are there now. I then had time back with Alan, and he had a daughter who is a singer. So I said to him, would you like to hear her singing? So he squeezed my hand, and I went and got the tape recorder and, and started playing. And we sat and we listened, and I cried a bit, and he was frightened. The music finished, and we were looking at each other, and he had so much to say. I could see in his eyes, and I had so much to say, but I couldn't, because he wouldn't have been able to respond. And I was holding his hand between mine, and I just looked at him, and I said, I love you so much. And you know, he reached over his other hand, and he got mine between his, and he squeezed it so tight, just so tight. But his hands were becoming cold and clammy. And I thought, that's peculiar. And I didn't know why. But it felt somehow something was happening, but I didn't know what was happening. And I decided I was not going to be without him this evening and this night. And I was going to stay the night. I was not going to go home. But I'm diabetic on insulin. I needed my nighttime insulin. So 
I went home. He died five minutes before I arrived back. I raced upstairs and held him, and his hands were warm and soft, as always. I, I just didn't understand. I now realize, had the process been explained to me, I would perhaps have coped better. I may have understood more, and perhaps I would not have left him because I would have realized that the end was actually quite close. I have to say, I received marvelous care and support from that nursing home, as Alan had done when he was there. And I am still there. And now we have progressed so much in the end of life care, not only for the person, but for the relatives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Norma. Um, Yeah, I think what research tells us is that end-of-life care for people with dementia in every setting, be that hospital or home or care home, is generally suboptimal and, and, and even of, of, of often of poor quality. So what's different about care for people with dementia? And it's all the obvious things. Let's get them all up. Um, communication. You can't talk with the person always, as in the later stages of the illness. In the later stages of the illness, there are distressed reactions. And we've talked a little bit about language, and I'm very, very anxious about, about the language that we use for distressed reactions. And we talk about behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. And, and then more commonly, we talk about challenging behavior. And those of us with very specialist grammar talk about behavior that challenges but I really think what we see is distressed reactions, <laughs> very common to all of us. Um, there's this uncertain time frame, and very importantly, there is still, among doctors and nurses, I imagine not here, but, but I still speak and hear from doctors and nurses who really have not understood that uh, dementia is a terminal illness. And if the professionals are not acknowledging that once you have a diagnosis of dementia, you will die with or from it, then how on earth are families to get that idea? Yeah, Subi gave us a quick run through. Um, in advanced dementia, hospital care is distressing for patients and families. It's more expensive, they have longer admissions, there are more early readmissions, um, and it's dangerous. If two people go into hospital with pneumonia, and one of them has dementia, the person with dementia is four times more likely to die than the other person. The outcomes are generally poor, weight loss, pressure sores, infections, um, and people have more inappropriate interventions if they have a dementia, less symptom management, and particularly less pain management. There are fewer referrals for specialist, for specialist palliative care, less recognition of their spiritual needs, and families are asked to make decisions in a time of crisis. So what does palliative care offer to people with dementia? I had a job briefly, it was my introduction to dementia, as nurse facilitator for end-of-life care for people with dementia, and that must never be said over the telephone. <laughs> so I would say I used to work at St. Christopher's. And what I used to do, what I was doing, and, and to some extent still do, um, for people with dementia was to ensure that there was future planning, including a do not resuscitate order and no inappropriate hospitalization. I tried to offer family support, and there's so little support if you're used to the hospice world with 90% of cancer treatment. There's very little support for people with dementia. I did my best with pain and symptom management using an observational pain scale is a, a really important start for everybody. 
we're not good at any level, I think, at symptom assessment for people with advanced dementia. Um, then there's using an integrated pathway for, for last days, and usually that is the Liverpool Care Pathway, and a bereavement support. But I didn't really come into palliative care for those particular things. I, I was always, I think, more interested in quality of life and in, what, in meeting people's psychological, emotional, spiritual needs. Not me, well, trying to help people to, 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 um, to live the lives they wanted to. And Dr. Saunders really, I think, summed that up. Um, the essence of palliative care for me. You matter because you're you. And you matter to the end of your life. And we will help you not only to die peacefully, but to live until you die. And the great question really is, what on earth is living until you die if you have fragmentary speech, fragmentary memory, can't move around? What, what is quality of life? What is meaningful activity? And I don't know. I'd love to hear your answers, but we, we really don't have time. So you can imagine how relieved I was to find an answer, not the answer, but an answer. And, and so far, for me, the best that I've come up with. Um, and this is a book on the Namaste Care Program by um, Joyce Simard, who is, she's now a professor, but she's um, by background a social worker um, from the United States. And yeah, that's, that's what Namaste means, and that's why she chose the, the, the title to honor the spirit within. And her background was really around activities and um, the kind of thing that we were hearing about on Poynings Ward, um, reminiscence, keeping people engaged, um, and she was called back to the care homes where she'd worked as a consultant, setting up, you know, more or less 24-hour activity programs, um, because there were people who were still kind of not engaging, that people reached a point where they didn't sing along, they didn't shout out the answers to the quiz, they weren't, um, you know, happy to sort out different sizes of buttons. They weren't doing that, thank you, Norma. Um, and really for a man like this, who, as you can see, is, is kind of beautifully dressed up, beautifully cared for, he's even got a hat on, but he's really not doing anything, is he? And I think it's very hard not to conjure up quite a few people of one's not acquaintance in care homes particularly where they're sitting at the back of a room if there's an activity or they're sitting in front of the television very like that or beside the nursing station um, and yes an MMSE of zero to seven well in my experience generally just zero and has been for years and years um, not walking these people not able to participate in a conventional activity program. So Joyce came up with, with her care program. And it centers on the power of loving touch. Page behind. Um, here she is. That's Joyce. And I believe her great grandson. And we all know that skin-to-skin -skin contact is essential for a, a baby to thrive, and that children who lack skin-to-skin -skin contact fail to thrive and even die. And why would that not be true, perhaps, at the end of life, the other end of life? When we're talking about um, well-being in dementia care, for some reason, and it may have something to do with the stigma and the general negativity, but we tend to define it in um, terms of its opposite. So what contributes to well-being? Um, we find by looking at a systematic review of non-pharmacological interventions for reducing agitation. And here they are, 
aromatherapy, thermal bath, calming music, hand massage, the only interventions with moderate efficacy. And we, that, that means pretty good in scientific terms in what, what I understand. <laughs> These are the key elements of Joyce's Namaste Care Program. Honoring the spirit within, that everyone involved participates in that valuing of the person. Bringing people into the presence of others so they're not isolated in, even within a care home lounge. Bringing them together. Comfort, including pain management, is essential. There's no point in trying to give somebody quality of life if they're in pain. That's fundamental palliative care knowledge. <laughs> and then trying to create some kind of meaningful activity and connection. And in the Namaste Care Program, that comes through the five senses, through sight, touch, taste, hearing, and smell. And meaningful activity, I'll come on to a slide, but um, I think you have meaningful activity when you meet someone's psychological needs. Um, and hopefully some of that is, is done through the, the sensory interventions. But also, I think personal care in a care home, for example, is often done with gloves on um, at great speed. <laughs> um, but personal care is something that we have all done all our lives. And with some dishonorable exceptions, I would just guess that everyone in this room has washed their face and brushed their hair almost every day of their life, or someone has done it for them. And I think that using personal care done very gently, very slowly, is something which can be recognized by people at a very late stage of dementia as something extremely familiar. They know what, what is happening. And generally, it is a pleasurable experience. You usually feel better when you've got, when you've had, a, had a good wash and brush up. Life story is essential, we heard earlier, to, to actually being able to reach the spirit within. Care staff education, none of this happens without people having training. Family meetings are really key, and I'll come on to that. Um, and care of the dying and after death care also comes in the Namaste Care program. It's, yeah. Um, Namaste is, involves care homes in changing how they work, but it doesn't involve more staff, and it doesn't involve new space, and it doesn't require expensive equipment. It does require commitment to changing how you work. I think if you think of it, how often you go into a care home lounge, and there will be uh, a number of people sitting there and very often the television well almost always the television will be on and very often there will also be a carer doing some paperwork checking the weights or adding up fluid charts something like that namaste says well you've got a carer there <laughs> why not create another environment bring those people together bring more in and provide a structured program of of care so you need to, what you think of is what is the average allocation within care homes? And it varies from four to eight, and I'm told in the States it's 12. So, you know, that's the worst possible scenario. But somewhere, a carer has an, a number of people. And so long as the namaste care worker has that number of people in their, in their namaste room, well, actually, they are pulling their weight, fundamentally. They're, that's not a, you don't need different numbers of staff. You need them to be doing things differently. And the namaste care worker is with people in the namaste room. And we'll come on to the, some photographs in a moment. Um, but that person has, has two key tasks. And one is really just to chase a smile, to, to find pleasure, to find people, to, to create pleasure for people. And the other is observation. If you spend time with people and you become very familiar with them, then you will have improved symptom assessment 
and especially assessment of pain. You know if somebody's not comfortable, if you see them day after day. Um, there's an immediate response to agitation. Um, often people, agitation builds up, but if somebody goes and is with them or finds what they need, that will calm. And we have even sometimes found an improved recognition of dying, but I think that's um, a very, very difficult thing in um, advanced dementia. Namaste. Namaste relies on a slightly theatrical change of environment. <laughs> um, and this is a care home lounge, which they decided they would paint after they'd been doing it for about six weeks. Um, found some old furniture, rearranged it to look very homely. So the Namaste care worker uh, begins their day by gathering supplies, tidying the room, maybe just, just turning off the strip lighting, dimming the room a little bit, put some lavender in an aromatherapy diffuser, put on some soft music, probably classical when people are coming in, and, and maybe if you've got a DVD but you might not have, then you might put on a nature video or something very abstract, just not the telly. <laughs> music and film, yeah. Very important, I think, it's a, a key element of the program is that people are welcomed individually and by name when they enter the room. It is that importance of uh, fundamental greetings are very, very well retained and it is just that business of being recognized individually. Positioned comfortable, comfortably and assessed for pain and, and, and discomfort. Here is care as meaningful activity. And so there are all these different things. But, but essentially it begins with washing the face with warm water slowly and, and, and very, very gently. Um, we've had men who are very, have been very resistant to, to shaving have actually accepted it in the Namaste room. In a calm environment, people respond differently. When shaving's taken very, very gently, um, when shaving's taken very gently, then people will often recognize it better for what is actually happening and not so much as a <laughs> sudden assault. <laughs> um, nail care, personal likes, makeup maybe, but, but also very importantly, sensory stimulation. And, and I think a hand rub, massage is probably the basic the basic tool in the Namaste Care Program. If I had to choose the two most powerful elements, it would be um, touch and, and music, I think. And I think every one of us can recognize that in, a, in our own lives. Hydration and food treats, yeah. Very often in care homes, people will have a drink at breakfast time, and then there will be a cup of tea or coffee or a drink sometime mid-morning, and then again at lunchtime. And for any of you who have been family carers and tried to get decent amounts of fluid into people, you will remember that actually, it's very often when you give somebody a drink, very rare to get down more than, you know, one inch maybe, sometimes, sometimes one and a half, but it's all about coming back. And the nam in the namaste room, you have together the people who are perhaps hardest to persuade to drink and eat. And because the carer is with all those people together, rather than chasing the, uh, you know, the, the man who wants to get out or, or the lady who keeps taking things from other people or the two people who keep getting into a bit of a fight, because they're with the people who are least able, they are more able to be a butterfly and to just go from one person to another, giving them a drink when they're awake, giving them a drink you know, after the, before the massage so that by the time they're asleep after they've had it, they've, you know, it's just a, a continuous process. And some of the care homes we've worked with have had to change their pad order <laughs> because people have been taking significantly more fluids. And I think we always forget, when we're talking about sensory stimulation, we just forget about um, taste. And I know that some people have lost taste. But a spoonful of honey goes down terribly well. <laughs> and sweetness is, is very, very acceptable in, in people with dementia, I've I found, as, as the dementia advances. Now, namaste, as you probably, be, I hope, getting a sense, is, is really very much around calming. And for people with agitation, it has been our experience that 
people come in and very often, very often some people who are, are just walking around come in under their own steam. <laughs> but, but, but people who are often agitated very often will find some relaxation. And not always, but, but very often those people may relax and, and go to sleep. And that's wonderful because actually their lives are incredibly tense and, and, and resting is, is an immense bonus. Others are very closed down. Um, perhaps there is an element of depression as well. Um, and, and especially for people who have deafness and, and blindness, problems with, with hearing and sight, they, they often, with the dementia, will, or will close down a lot. And, and we have found that, that sensory stimulation very much brings those people out. So, on the one hand, namaste is about calming, but it's really not about just everybody going to sleep. <laughs> it's also about finding for people who are able to relax, or people who have perhaps woken up, something that honors the spirit within when they are awake. And I must say, you know, I, I along with a lot of other people, I think, fought dolls for a while. <laughs> but once you have seen the power of, of someone having a doll, if that is something that gives them security and affection and, and inclusion then and, and attachment, it's immensely powerful, and, and there's a lady in one of the care homes we work in who has, has a doll and who loves music, and she is someone who has been shouting a lot and swearing a lot and is generally resistive to all personal care. But you can now see her very often holding the doll and singing. I wish I had a recording. I've asked somebody to make one. <laughs> She's a very beautiful voice. Um, Malcolm talked about noticing the seasons. In Namaste Now, I think we would be changing from snowdrops to daffodils. <laughs> um, and when, when I took the picture, it was, it was autumn, and we had just some very good smelling herbs. But, but it's no good saying yesterday was Tuesday, so today is Wednesday. Orientation just slightly to the, to the seasons, to the weather. That's, that's perhaps what is possible. And it's, some of it's around having fun. It's about trying to, as I say, to, to, to chase a smile. And I can't resist bringing something for the party bag. This is my favorite toy. <laughs> oh, that's going on to a memory box. I'm, I, I may deafen you all, but. <laughs> it, it certainly scares my cats, but, <laughs> but, but I, very, very many people have, have, will smile for, the, for, the, for this bird. <laughs> and it's about looking for things which, which do create just that spontaneous, joyful moment that, that, that Malcolm talked about earlier. So here's an apron with different textures. A memory box, really important. This, is, this can, there can be one-to-one -one time within the namaste room. So it's very good to have things that actually bring up that individual and, and memories for them. Yeah, turn off the telly. Natural DVDs or, or sometimes perhaps even just abstract ones. <coughs> Namaste is not just for residents. It's also for, for family and also for staff. It's that incredibly important triangle of relationship-centered care. Family, staff, and the person with dementia. I think one of our most positive experiences has come from staff who have really benefited. I know when I go into uh, the Namaste room that I actually am always aware of, of, of relaxation. You know, I can actually feel my heart beating a little bit slower. <laughs> and if it affects me as a kind of just a visitor, I think it must be very powerful. And certainly staff really enjoy going into the room they work very, very hard, and they work very, very fast. And just for them to relax and to see the people that they're with as people, for the task to be creating well-being, that's very rewarding. People go into those jobs because they want to care, 
And namaste gives them a chance really to care. I think it's also very powerful for, for families. Visits can be very difficult. And it's helpful, for example, to be able to say, your mum really loves chocolate ice cream. Watch her face. <laughs> or when I massaged his hands yesterday, he was, he was smiling at me. Why don't you try that? And people, we're not a touchy-feely society, you know. I'm amazed to find myself doing all of this stuff. But that is very often what is needed. And it does make people, it gives people a better sense of connection if they are actually able to establish, you know, what, what gives someone pleasure, to re-establish touch. Very often that doesn't happen once people are taken into a care home. I'm going to ask Norma to come back just to give a, a carer's perspective on, on, on the Namaste Care Programme. Yeah. Well, you see, Namaste for me is not a programme. Namaste is an atmosphere. It's, it's a feeling. You go into the Namaste room and sometimes you can feel you could almost reach out and touch the atmosphere. Before this, um, people, certainly in the afternoons, they went to their own individual room, they lay there in isolation, looking at four walls, and occasionally somebody popped in to see if they were okay. Here they are together. They are listening to music, or perhaps it's birdsong, there are smells, it can be lavender, freesia, whatever. And there is a feeling of life and love. They have touch. It may be just the holding of a hand and talking very softly. Or it is, as Min has said, the gentle massage. But they are there, they are together. They're not isolated in a room. And I tell you, the atmosphere, because they are together, is there the moment you walk in. I am advocate for one of the ladies in the Namaste room. Uh, she's called Gladys. And I first knew Gladys when Alan first went to the nursing home. Gladys is blind. And all those years ago, she used to talk all day to an imaginary friend. And you could occasionally have a conversation with Gladys, but then she would be back talking to her imaginary friend. And she was often quite restless in her, in her chair, physically restless, and her face was always like this. And um, she didn't like touch. If you put your hand on hers, she would pull it away or she'd push yours away. Gladys now, of course, is much further along in her journey, and she no longer talks to an imaginary friend. And you cannot really have a conversation with her. But sometimes now, when you talk to her, you get sometimes a little laugh, sometimes a little smile, and you find that she listens to the music and her face has relaxed. Her body is calmer. And for me, the magic is now, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes I will say, Gladys, I'm going to put my hand on yours. I put it on. It isn't pulled away. And then very slowly, a hand will grasp your finger and she holds on so tightly to that finger and she will not let go. You're sitting there for a long time, but it is a wonderful long time. And I think that is namaste. I have to admit that all of this is created by the program, but it the creation is wonderful. And I have noticed in staff a 
big difference. Because they have grown in confidence and belief in themselves, because they are seeing what is happening to the people they care for, they themselves are happy in what they're doing. And they themselves respond. So we have that almost, it's not an interaction, but it is a response and a feeling which moves between the staff and the people that they are caring for. And here, again, there is love and there is life. And that, I think, is the essence of Namaste. Thank you. Thank you very much again, Nora. Nora. Mm. So that's the Namaste Care Program. And we haven't really reached the, the, a, a core element of it. And I think we might be wondering what St. Christopher's Hospice is doing involving itself in kind of long-term conditions in this way. And I think a very key element of, of the Namaste Care Programme is that entry to the Namaste Care Programme triggers a family meeting. So it's around seeking help from families as to how to honour the spirit within. What music does she like? Could you create a memory box if you haven't made one already? What, are, what might be sensory triggers for, for reminiscence? So it's also an opportunity to acknowledge disease progression because it's about why does your husband, your mother, your wife, whoever, why do they need this particular care program now? Last year, actually, she was still, you know, in the, in the activities group and very engaged with, you know, singing for the brain or still enjoyed um, outings, whatever. Now things are changed. The disease is progressing. It's a chance to talk about end of life in a positive context. I think care staff are often frightened of these conversations because it's just about death and dying. It's a negative conversation. You're not, you know, it's, it's very difficult. But this is about honoring the spirit within. It's about establishing that comfort and pleasure are the goals of care. That actually hospital, that medicine generally can offer very little at this stage in the illness and that it's a time when we should be ensuring that there is quality of life to the end of life and that that will involve planning end of life care so it as as we were saying when when philip was talking about advanced care planning it should be a process over time and if it if it's not already in place this is a very good um rite of passage a very good time to reinstate um, the idea of end-of-life care planning because I, I think the, 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 it's good to do it while the person is not ill, not to do it over a hospital bed or when somebody already has an aspiration pneumonia, which is certainly my experience of when people ask you to do end-of-life care planning. So comfort and pleasure are the aims of care and the, the final goal is a peaceful, dignified death in the place where they are and where they can continue to have namaste care. That namaste goes on when someone is dying, that it continues at the bedside, it's part of end of life care. Comfort and mouth care, loving touch, reassuring presence, supporting the family. It's just a continuation. And goes on actually to when the person has died. Honoring the spirit continues, laying a body out, accompanying the body from the care home. I saw last week in, in, a, in a, one of the Namaste care homes that they had put a photograph frame at reception with the, a picture of the person who had died and just something to say that she was, she was missed and when she had died so that everybody who came in would, would actually acknowledge that, that um, a member of, of the care home team, a member of the care home um, community had, had died. Um, and then there is bereavement support. So that was it. And I think Eleanor will deal with the questions a bit. <laughs> Take my bird.